All right, let's get to work. Time for official opening. I hope you enjoyed that story. All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you who are celebrating it. Good morning. It's another wonderful morning at Chem 1211 with your host, me, Dr. White. We got a lot to do. I hope you enjoyed the story. I took out a video about my St. Patrick's Day memory. All right, let's go here. All right, quick thumbs up, people. Do you see Chem 12, 11 test? Thank you. All right, yesterday I posted about three, quarter to three yesterday afternoon, this announcement. A week from today on the 24th after class, I will be giving test number two. At that time, I'll email you the password for test number two PDF file. And I'll have the PDF file in Blackboard sometime Tuesday afternoon. I've got to write the test. Well, I actually did write it. I'll still proof it a couple more times. And you'll have until the next day, Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. to take the test and upload your answers to test number two. This is important as a single PDF file. You've been doing that as for the labs. All right. Test number two will cover chapters five through 10. This covers chemical bonding, including ionic covalent bonds. Those problem sets I've already done. It will cover mole and mole related topics, including balanced chemical equations. Yes, there'll be, I think three or four, probably four uh, balanced chemical equation problems. Test, the test has 21 problems, nine pages, relax. I write my test. So if you have done the practice problems and study, it should take you about 35, 40 minutes for this test. You'll have an hour or so. There are no multiple choice, but some of the questions have multiple parts like part A, B, and C. Now it will have topic area on chemical bonds and related topics we will have 49 points on mole and mole related topics, including balanced chemical equations or reactions, it will have 56. And if you notice, it adds up to 105. So there's five, yes, five, five bonus points. Now I don't do what other instructors do or some instructors do and put the last problem, here's your five bonus points and you make it impossible. That's not fair. So what I do is Take some tea first. I have the whole thing add up to 105 and you pick which five points you wanna call bonus, really doesn't matter. All right, remember for this test, underneath their name it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And it also will now say, use three significant figures for all atomic masses. Now, this is important. I reserve the right to subtract up to 25 points for anyone who doesn't follow instructions, mainly upload it as a single PDF file, or anyone who does not upload your test uh, answers on time. I reserve that right, unless you have some real pressing emergency. But other than that, get it in on time. Now, I'd recommend you download test number two PDF file also have a periodic table and instructions in case you don't know how, which I think most of you do by now, how to create a single PDF file like with your smartphone. Anybody ever find a dumb phone? And you should practice this. Uh, and I'll say something about this after I read the announcement. 
If you have any questions, please email me. I'll be um, checking my email frequently Wednesday afternoon and evening. Also, if you have any questions about the test, stop by my office hour Wednesday night. There will be a regular Wednesday Zoom lecture. I'll be posting the scores uh, 1 p.m. on Blackboard. And at that time, I'll post an announcement and send you an email. About that time, your actual test scores are available, Blackboard. And then I'll also email you like I did test number one, each student the points received for problems and of each part of the problem. And on Monday, now next week we'll have class and the week after will be spring break. And the Monday after spring break, which is uh, a couple weeks from to, uh, uh, two weeks from this coming Monday, I believe, I'll go over test number two answers in our Zoom meeting, but I will delete it from the video, YouTube, YouTube video. And if you can't make it to that Monday Zoom meeting, you can always see the answers in my office hour. And again, that's test number two, which will be one week from today. Now, one thing I do want to mention, when you take and make your PDF file, before you upload it, look at it. Here's what you should be looking for. One, did you include all the pages of the test or all the problems if you don't have a printer and you just hand write it out? If you hand write it out, you do not have to write out the questions like how many moles this or that. You just show your work and your answer. I highly recommend this test. Show your work. Because if you make a math error and you don't show your work, you get zero points. If you show your work and you make a math error, I only take out one point. Now, the other thing when you're making your PDF file, besides making sure you've included all the pages or the pro answers for all that, make sure you can read it. Because if you can't read it, I can't. And make sure the lighting is good enough when you take and make, if you don't have a scanner, your PDF file. Any questions? When does spring break start? For COD, it starts a week from this Monday. Hold on, let's get a calendar up. This is probably my favorite calendar on the internet. And if you notice, today is the 17th. You'll be taking the test on the 24th. And spring break starts Monday, the week of Monday the 29th. And that will be your spring break. Interesting enough, I teach at Elgin Community College the next week. Sometimes they coincide, sometimes they don't. This is a year where they don't. And next week, they'll be off, but I'll still be teaching here. And the following week, you'll be off, but I'll be teaching at ECC. So spring break starts Monday, March 29th. Any other questions? You're welcome. And as always, all questions are good questions in my class. All right, let's get back to work. And did any of you happen to be outside and feel the wind on your face and say, wow, those are gases, molecules hitting me very quickly. Did you do that? That's chemistry. Now, we we're talking about gases on Monday. This material I'm covering right now will not be on test two but it will be on test three. And one of the important parameters that you measure concerning a gas is pressure. And pressure, when we're talking about gases, we're generally talking about atmospheric pressure, and that's measured with a barometer. And an important measurement unit is millimeter mercury. And let me see if I can find it again.
All right, everybody see the barometer on their screen? Thank you. All right, now the original barometer was invented by the Italian scientist. I don't know back then if they call them chemists, but Torricelli. And what he did was took a little dish of mercury and inserted it in the dish and evacuated too, which means they had a vacuum in it. And then in this picture, you don't see it, but I'm sure there was a clamp right here to keep the tube upright. And then he measured, saw that the pressure from the atmospheric gas pushed down on the mercury in this little dish and pushed it up the evacuated tube. And the distance from the level of the liquid in the mercury dish to the top of the tube, mercury in the tube, you could measure. And you could measure it. And for some reason back then, well, it was in Italy, they used millimeters. In England and the United States, we use inches. And the atmospheric pressure is pushing up the mercury in the tube. Now, it turns out mercury wasn't until 70s that they later even that mercury is quite hazardous material. It's a cumulative of poison. And the more you get in your system, the more damage it does. And eventually it will kill you if you get enough and you can't get it out, which is why we no longer have mercury thermometers or they don't use mercury in barometers. Now they use other ways of measuring the pressure, such as electronic uh, sensors. That reminds me, when I was a kid, about five or six, and you could tell people didn't know the hazards of mercury or wanted to think about it, there was a little toy, it was about this big. It had a little maze with little plastic um, walls, you know, like you see a maze for a mouse to go through. And in there, they had a big drop of mercury. And the back was cardboard. And I had one, my friends had them. I don't remember if mine got destroyed, but I wonder how many kids got exposed to mercury. Anyways. Now, the unit of uh, pressure, one unit is millimeter of mercury. Now, in order, in honor of Torricelli's great achievement and working with gases, there's also the unit Tor, and Tor is short for Torricelli, and one millimeter of mercury equals one Tor. And on St. Patrick's Day, do I have any green ink? I don't think I do. Hold on while I move this back down. Yep. In honor of St. Patrick's Day. You should know this. This will be given an important information, test number three, coming up down the road. And I used to make students memorize this, but I'll give this to you. But you have to know how to use that. Well, how do you use that? And the way you use it is And the question is, how many millimeters of mercury is 500, 851.6 tor? So what do you do? Well, I've been brainwashing you 
What are you trying to find? What are you given? And therefore, guess what time it is? Yes, it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. <laughs> Love that whistle. And the only thing I have to work with is this. And I want to get to millimeters of mercury. How do I use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis? Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the units. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? One millimeter mercury equals one tor. This is a definition. Therefore, these are exact numbers. So in here, we put one, one. And therefore, if I do the math before I do that, tor divided by tor, cancel out, and you're left with millimeters of mercury. And the answer is 851.6 millimeters of mercury. Bet you thought you were done with your good buddy, your good friend. Uh-uh. Is your good buddy, your good friend throughout the rest of the semester. And I'll let you try one. And there's one for you to try. How many tor is 753? millimeters of mercury. While you're doing that, one of the things I have, which I'll share with you is, I have a photographic memory and I have a very good memory even now. And I can close my eyes and I can see myself with that group of friends walking down Grand River and seeing the tanks come at us. Oh, I can still remember that was an amazing, amazing happening in my life. That really happened? Yeah. Tanks attacking the Capitol. All right, I hope you're all done. Let's do this. How do I do this? Well, what am I trying to find? Tor, and I could have put how many tor of oxygen or gas, but for now, to keep it simple, and I have 753 millimeters of mercury. And therefore, this is the only thing I have to start with. Oops, wrong thing. That's not what I want. And using unit analysis, I have some ratio. What do I want my final answer to be? Tor. And now I'll use unit analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of unit-wise goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? I come right here and it's to find one millimeter mercury, Hg is the symbol for mercury, equals one tor. And notice my units cancel out. And if I do the math, remember these are exact numbers, I get 753 tor. And that's one unit of pressure. Now, it turns out there's another unit of measure, unit of pressure, that's very important. And that measurement is mainly used for gases. In fact, I can't think of anywhere else it's used. It's used for gases, and it helps in certain, what well, I will teach you later, either today and also next week, 
called the gas laws. And what's that other measurement? And this measurement was defined at sea level, zero elevation from sea level. The atmospheric pressure is defined as 760 millimeters of mercury. Even though it's St. Patrick's Day, Dr. White loves red. And it's not being subtle, subtle Wednesday. Now, at atmospheric pressure, like here in Chicago, we're at sea level. When there's no storms coming through, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 torr, because one millimeter of mercury equals one torr. However, here's something new. 760 millimeters of mercury is defined as at, at sea level being one atmosphere, which is abbreviated by the letters ATM. Wow, I even wrote it on the slide. Know this. So remember, 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 torr equals one atmosphere. And let's write that. And this will be given to you an important information, but you still have to know how to use it. So 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 torr equal one atmosphere. Now, this is a definition, therefore, 760, 760, and 1 are all exact numbers, which means they don't play a role in determining significant figures of any operation you use with those, like multiplication division. And again, 760 and 1 in this right here. 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 torr equal one atmosphere is a definition. And guess what? They're all exact numbers. Now, there are other, uh, for this slide, I'm going to turn the switch. Will this ever be on a test or final? Click to the off position. Uh, other measurements of mercury, instead of millimeters, you have inches and one 29.9 inches of mercury equal one atmosphere. Also, another measure of pressure is pounds per square inch, abbreviated PSI, also sometimes PSIG, where the G stands for gauge. And you'll see that in chemical plants. And one atmosphere is 14.7 PSI. Now, for some reason in weather forecasts, they usually give you inches of mercury, never atmospheres. That's only used in calculations, I think in just chemistry and maybe physics. And PSI, well, you'll never see that in atmospheres. You see it in PSI and um, when I worked in chemical plants, we always used PSI, pounds per square inch, for certain reactions we did under high pressure. Now, where are you going to find PSI? I bet you never thought about it, but if you own a car or if you know someone who owns a car, the tires are filled with a gas. Usually it's air. We'll talk a lot more about this this chapter, but I hope you all check your tire pressure at least once a month. I do. I have an older car, so I don't have the sensors like newer cars have where you just press the button. You can see it on your, uh, in your dashboard. But the stuff inside your tires that keeps it inflated 
is a gas. And when you go to check your tires, you have a gas gauge and mine measures in PSI. And for my tires, I keep it about 35 PSI. If you think about it, that's more than twice the pressure of the atmosphere around it. And because of the higher pressure, that's why your tires are inflated. The gas is trying to push out. And when it's not high enough, it looks flat, which I hope none of you get. I've had enough in my lifetime. So these are measurements that I will not use this semester, but I thought I'd make you aware of it. But this one you should know, and this you should know, which we already talked about. So what does that mean? It's pressure pack practice time. And let's do the first one. How many tor is 452 millimeters of mercury? And let's go to the whiteboard. Wish there was a way, hold on, let's do an experiment. I don't think it's gonna work, but maybe it will. Is that what I want? One sec. And it worked. All right, let's do this. So the question is, How many tor, let's call this A, B, C, and D. How many tor is this? Well, we already did that. And you know, you're trying to find tor. Better yet, I'm gonna let you try the first one. And then I'll do B. Also clean up B. Everybody, you do A right now on your own. It looks like everybody's just about done. So let's go ahead and do this. And the question is, how many tor? So we're trying to find tor, which is a measure of pressure, are 452 millimeters of mercury. And this is what we start with. We want to get to tor. So I'll use my good friend, my good buddy, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio, whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. Where do I get those numbers? You could either put one 
TOR equals seven, one millimeter mercury or 760 equals 760. Let's just do the one. These are exact numbers. So the answer would be 452 TOR. Now, let me do this one. How many, ooh, atmospheres. ATM is the atmosphere, is a unit of pressure, are 832 millimeters of mercury. And now what do we do? Well, this is the only number we have to work with. What units do I want my answer in? Atmosphere. So I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? From here. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Also equals 760 tor, but I'm not using that. Notice millimeters of mercury cancel out because anything divided by itself equals the number one, which means it cancels out. And now I'm ready to go. But let me remind you, this is important to remember, both the one and the 760 are exact numbers. And therefore they don't play a role in this calculation. This is three significant figures. My answer should be three significant figures. And let me open up my calculator. And here's the number. Everybody see my spreadsheet? Thank you. And I'll let you round this off to three significant figures. I'll give you three seconds. One, two, time's up. Keep the one, keep the zero, keep the nine. Use the four to round off. That's four or less, drop everything. So the answer would be 1.09 atmospheres. And that's how you do it. Guess what? I'm going to share the fun and let you do C. So have some fun. And Let me put this so you can see it. How many atmospheres is 777 tor? Your turn. Boy, time flies when you're having fun with chemistry on St. Patrick's Day, Ervin Gobra. That's all the Irish I know who I learned from a neighbor. That was in East Lansing too. Kathleen Goslin, well, I haven't thought of her in ages. She lived down the hall with her. She had two roommates and, um, or three, three roommates. And she was staunch Irish. I mean, she partied hard on St. Patrick's Day. The story with the tank, she was out of town because it was spring break. All right, since I know some of you like to do the thumbs up, when you're done, give me a thumbs up. And remember, as I mentioned yesterday, if you can, which makes me feel good and all fired up, if you can turn on your video for your webcam, please do. I appreciate it. I get to see faces instead of names. 
And for those of you who have yours on, thank you. All right, let's do this. Question is, what are we doing in C? How many atmospheres? What are or is 770 tor? Well, the only number I have to use is this. So I'm going to use it. If I use some ratio, what units do I want my answer to be in? Atmospheres. And now I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of unit-wise goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? Right here. 760 tor equals one atmosphere. And this, I'll give it to you. I used to make students memorize this, but this will be on important information. Test number three. And now, before I pick up my calculator, notice tor divided by tor cancel out because anything divided by itself equals the number one. And now I can go. Now, let me remind you, both the one and the 760 are exact numbers play no role in the calculation. Therefore, three significant figures here, 777, I should get three significant answer. So now I'll go to my calculator. And that's the number I get. And I'll let you all round that off to three significant figures. And the answer is, keep the one, keep the zero, keep the two, use the two to round off. That's four or less, I'll drop everything. That's 1.02. Atmospheres. And I'll let you do D, how many tor is 2.1 atmospheres? Remember, use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And this is one. And let me just remind you, because you may not be able to see it. So remember, 760 millimeters mercury equals 760 tor equal one atmosphere. And you should be working on D, how many tors? 2.1 atmospheres.
Well, it looks like everybody's done, so I'm going to get to work. And if we look at this, how many tor? So what are we trying to find? Tor, remember that's the unit of pressure, is 2.1 atmospheres. ATM is atmospheres, a unit of pressure. So this is the only thing I have to work with. What units am I trying to get to? Tor. Therefore, I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. And I'm talking about the units. And I'll write those in now. And where do I get a relationship between Tor and atmospheres? Oh, look, somebody was nice enough to write it right there. And 760 Tor equals one atmosphere. And I can put that in there. Now, before I pick up my calculator, first of all, I'll check that the units cancel out and the atmospheres divided by atmospheres cancel out because anything divided by itself equals the number one. And remember both the one and the 760 are exact numbers. This has two significant figures. All non-zero numbers are significant. My answer should have two significant figures. And now I'll go to my calculator. And I'll also come over here. As a lot of you are probably in scientific notation. And if I'm over here, this would round off to two significant figures, 1.6. Remember, keep the one, keep the five, use the nine to round off. It's five or higher. I'll drop that, increase that by one. 1. 1.6 times 10 to the third, this rounds off to 1,600. So either one would be acceptable on a test. And here are your answer. And that's how you use conversion. 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor equal one atmosphere. And if I look at the clock, which I just did, oh, it's time to take a break. So with that in mind, I'll see you at 1055, five minutes, because I can get up and stretch. And you can too, or you don't have to. It's a free country still. I'll see you in five.
Oh no, I was running late. Sorry about that. Let's go back to work. But before I did, I forgot to tell you earlier that good news. I got my economic recovery check from the government, actually not a check, deposit in my bank account. Uh, if you hadn't been following it over the weekend, there were reports and it turns out many big banks, even though they got the money on Friday or Saturday morning, didn't post it to people's accounts until today so they could make some money off that. And by keeping it in their accounts for a couple of days, nice. But anyways, I got my money. Hopefully you did, you got yours. I wasn't sure if I'd get it because I thought I was pretty close to that 75,000 cutoff, not because of what they pay us to teach, but because I also consult too. That can be very lucrative at times, but I was just under 75. So yay, I got my money. All right, let's get back to gases. Ooh, I forgot. Important public service announcement from the management, me, Dr. White. Don't forget, if you have lab tomorrow, the lab we did last week is due tomorrow. And don't forget, if you have lab on Friday, the lab we did last Friday is due this Friday. Remember, get your labs in on time, please. End of the public service announcement. So we've done our pressure practice time. Say that three times quickly, fast, no. And let's talk about the gas laws. And before I talk about Boyle's law, a couple important things. First of all, everybody take a deep breath, let it out, take a deep breath. And I do this in a classroom too. I like how I do my finger thing. Let it, take a deep breath, let it out. Let's do it one more time. You feel all nice and relaxed, stay that way. Relax, we're gonna be doing, relax, some algebra. Relax, take a deep breath. I'll show you how to do that for the next couple of laws and stuff, but some of you get freaked out by algebra. Relax, take a deep breath, relax. Okay, now, if you think about back about the 1700s, early 1700s in Europe mainly, and it might've been Asia, my knowledge of what was going on there is not as good as Europe because that's what they taught history in grade school when I went to school more in Europe than Asia, which is wrong. But anyways, back then, what was happening, say 1700, 1705, the Industrial Revolution, which helped change uh, our country, our world, our country too. The United States was involved in that, but most of it was in Europe, especially England. Now, what was the thing that drove the Industrial Revolution? The ability to do things quicker with machinery. And how could they do that with machinery? They needed something to power the machinery. Originally, it was water, you know, the water wheel turning. And also, if you were in Netherlands, windmills. By the way, Dr. White loves windmills, otherwise known as Molnar. Uh, that's the English way of pronouncing it, not the Dutch way. And I worked for two Anglo Dutch companies, so I made a lot of trips to the Netherlands, and there's something, nothing more magnificent than seeing a windmill with its sails out. You, most Americans don't know this, but the frame, you, our frames for the sails, cloth that goes on there that catches the wind, turns it, and you have energy. Now, the original energy source was used for pumps to pump water out so the Dutch could re reclaim land under sea level, but also for grain. So anyways, they needed energy. And water and wind was one, but then they found out, first of all, the steam engine. 
and the steam engine provided energy to run the mills and other things like in England making cotton and making thread to make and other woven, woven uh, goods, cloth, and other things that use that equipment. And then later on, they replaced that with a gas engine. Now there's something simple, similar between the steam engine and the gas engine. Both have what's called pistons that move back and forth for various reasons. I'm not gonna go into the physics of that, but we will talk about the chemistry. So both the steam engine and the gasoline engine, otherwise known as the combustion engine, were very reliant to make power on gases and property of gases. So needless to say, if one of the most important areas of the industrial revolution was England, it was important to understand properties of gases. Plus, here's a secret, it was very lucrative to understand that. And that's always been a driving force in science, especially chemistry, money. Oh, hold on, St. Patrick's Day. Money, wait, money. I didn't want to make you feel guilty if I pulled out a hundred, so I just pulled out a 20. But anyway, uh, in the pandemic, it's always good to keep cash in the house. Uh, but I've thought about it, you know, for the last couple of years, I rarely use cash at all. But anyways, credit cards. And I don't have a balance on any of mine other than what I did this week. But back to the Industrial Revolution. So do you understand? Nice try, Danny. No, what it means is you should all give, Danny asked, does that mean you're all going to get $20 bills? Hold on. I'll be nice. Here, grab it. It's yours. Actually, you should all be... Uh, donating to the Save Dr. White Foundation, courtesy of the uh, address, the local train station underneath the rock by the end of the platform, wherever that is. But anyways, it was very lucrative to understand the properties of gases. And there were a couple of English scientists, I don't know if they were called chemists back then, 1700s, when the term chemist came about by the 1800s it was, but they're called scientists. And one of the important ones was Boyle. And Boyle came up with a law. Now, let me explain what is a law in science, especially chemistry. It's something that's always true. There's no exception. If I say this is a law, it always happens. T, that's not a law, but it's gonna happen. And there are a couple of these laws that use, show the relationship for certain parameters of a gas. And by understanding those parameters, we could learn how to improve steam engines and later on combustion engines so they work more effectively, which is important financially. I hope everybody grabbed through the screen their $20 bill. But anyways, let's move on. All right, do not write this down, but I'll read it to you. Volume of a sample boils law. That means this is always true. No exceptions. The volume of a sample of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure applied to the gas if the temperature is kept constant. Remember the hand pump. Okay, I will. What does that mean? Oh, I don't understand it. All right, relax. Let me show you Boyle's Law where you will understand it. Boyle's Law is really P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. And this is a better way of remembering Boyle's law. Ooh, that's an awful W. 
And let's look at Boyle's law. Now, what's P1? P1 is the initial pressure. V1 is the initial volume, and we're talking about of a gas. And P2 equals the final pressure. And V2 equals the final volume, again, of a gas. And since this is St. Patrick's Day, it's I'll still be subtle. Now, good news, I used to make students memorize all this. However, I stopped doing that because I'm testing chemistry, not your memory. So on test number three, important information, this and all of this will be given to you, but you have to know how to use this. So let's review this again. For Boyle's Law, the initial pressure, P1, times the initial volume, V1, equals the initial pressure P2 times the initial, the, what did I say? That, let me do that again, I got carried away. Boyle's Law, the initial pressure P1 times the initial volume V1 equals the final pressure P2 times the final volume P V2. So let's try one. Oops. Over spring break, I'm going to see if I can, I tried once and didn't succeed, have the macro buttons so I can change pens easier. Haven't done this a while, so I better. Thumbs up, people. Do you see the problem on the whiteboard? Thank you. Especially Justin, thank you for being my lead thumbs up person. What's that written on your thumb? Dr. White is great. <laughs> All right, let's do this. If a balloon has a pressure of 751 tor at 3.11 L, L is liters. And that's a volume measurement. Just like you go to a supermarket and buy a two liter bottle of pop, L liters. So if a balloon has a pressure of 751 tor at 3.11 liters, then what happens to the volume if the pressure is reduced to 333 tor? 
So what are we trying to find? Well, this is a pressure, but it's the final pressure. Or no, what happens to the volume? Well, I better start reading my own problems. If the pressure, so this volume is the final volume, V2. What are we given? Has a pressure, P1 equals 751 torr. V1 volume, the initial volume is 3.11 liters. And the final pressure, P2 equals 333 torr. So now if we look at this, we say we're trying to find a volume of a gas and we're given this pressure and volume. Therefore, how do we proceed? We use Boyle's law, P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. P1, initial pressure, V1, initial volume, P2, final pressure, V2, final volume. So how do I do that? Well, Boyle's law, P1 times V1 equals, that's a one, P2 times V2. Now, what am I trying to solve for? V2. Well, I'd like it alone on this side. Well, how can I get rid of something when you're multiplying? Well, anything divided by itself equals the number one. So I'm going to divide this side by what I want to get rid of, P2. However, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. Now, anything divided by itself cancels out. Therefore, I have V2 equals P1 times V1 over P2. I'm going to rewrite it. You don't have to, but Dr. White likes to. And good habits, I don't change. And here we have it. And this is how we calculate V2, which is what we're trying to find. Well, I took the time to figure out up here what P1, V1, and P2 are. P1 is 751 torr. V1 is 3.11 liters. And P2 is 333 torr. Now, before I pick up my calculator, I'm going to use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, real quick. Notice tor divided by tor, anything divided by itself equals number one cancels out. So this cancels out. What units am I left with? Liter, and that's a measure volume. So now, first of all, Dr. White's got to write this down so I don't forget these numbers. I can go to my calculator. Notice this is three significant figures. Three, three. Oh, he's in his red again. Let's go to my calculator. Thumbs up, people. You see the calculator on your screen? Thank you. And Round this off to three significant figures. I'll give you four seconds. One, two, three, three and a half, three and three quarter, four. Keep the seven, keep the zero, keep the one. Use the three to round off. That's four or less. So this all gets dropped. And the answer is 701. And that's 700 and uh, 700, 7.01 liters. And that's how you do that. Let's go through this again. 
when we look at the problem, the initial pressure and volume are P1 and V1, the initial pressure and volume, which is 751 and 3.11, torque pressure L liters volume. Then it says what happens to the volume, so that means we're trying to find the final volume, V2, if the pressure is reduced, that means a new pressure, P2, to 333 torque. And that's how you do that. And that's what would happen to the balloon. It would increase in volume. So let's try another one. Now, one of the things I talked about was, oh, by the way, up to now, I haven't done this, so I better warn you. Warning, warning, I'm going to do some artwork, and Dr. White never had any inkling of going to art school. My mother was a very good amateur artist. It never rubbed off on me. So when I draw anything, do artwork. Feel free to laugh as hard as you can, but don't hurt yourself and don't fall off your chair. Now, if you think about the gas engine and other things, an important thing is a piston. And a piston is a cylinder with a valve or that goes up and down. I don't know if it's called a plunger that goes up and down. Here's a rod to make it go up and down. And this is a piston. So let's do one. And in, a in a classroom, you'd be watching me write this on a whiteboard. Let's see, if a piston has a pressure of 651 torr at 10.7 liters, what happens to the pressure if you reduce the volume to... 0.511 liters. So let me read this again. If a piston, and I'll do this one. If a piston has a pressure of 651 torr at 10.7 liters, then what happens to the pressure if you reduce the volume of the cylinder to 0.511? So the first thing is, what are we trying to find? What happens to the pressure? Now, this is the final pressure, P2. What are we given? Well, it has a, if a piston has a pressure of 651 torr, that's the initial pressure. That's where we start off. Remember, torr is a measure of pressure. And then it has also a volume, the initial volume of 10.7 liters. And finally, we're going to reduce the volume to this number, which would be V2. So we're trying to find P2, and we're dealing with a gas, because you're in a piston, you're dealing with a gas. And you're given this pressure and volume. 
So what does that tell you? It's time for Boyle's Law. And I'll never ask on a test what's Boyle's Law, but I'll give you this. That's P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Now, I'm going to try something a little different right now. Hang on to your seats, not that different. Why don't you, what are we trying to solve for? P2, without putting the numbers in, just with the letters, why don't you try and solve on your own for P2? Don't put in numbers, please. Remember, just solve for P2 using relaxed algebra. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Remember, we're not doing the whole problem. All you're doing is solving for P2. Remember, if you're having difficulty now, we'll do more. So you'll get it. You will get it. I guarantee it. <laughs> but it's not money back. I'm going to keep this myself. All right, let's do this. Question is, what are we asked to solve for? P2. We're using Boyle's Law. So if we want P2, we want it alone on one side. We're doing a multiplication. So anytime you have a multiplication to get some rid of something, just divide by that. And we want to get rid of V2, because anything divided by itself equals the number one. So if I'm solving for P2, I want to get rid of V2. Well, if I want to get rid of it, I'll divide it. Whatever I do on one side, I have to do on the other. This is important. Students forget that. Please don't. And now, V2 divided by V2, as you see over here, anything divided by itself cancels out. I'm left with P2, which I'm trying to solve for, equals P1 times V1 over V2. And now you don't have to do it, but I do, because I like to. Good habits, I don't break. I'll rewrite it this way. All I've just done is rewrite it with P2 on this side. And now, since I've taken the time to figure out P1 is 650 tor 651 tor, V1 is 10.7 liters, and then underneath, V2 is 0 0.1, 0 0.511. And that's where I got all the values I'm putting in there. Once I've come up with this equation. Now, before I pick up my calculator, I'm going to use unit analysis again and check that the units cancel out. Notice I have liters liters, liters divided by liters, anything divided by itself, as you know, comes to number one. So that cancels out and I'm left with tor, which is a unit of pressure, yay. So now, oops, sorry about that. I'm ready to come down here and First of all, I'm going to write down the numbers, because if I don't, in a classroom, I'd look at the blackboard, or whiteboard, actually. And now, come back here.
and this is the number I get, and I'm going to do it in scientific notation too, because most of you are using a calculator in that. And if we round this off to three significant figures, and I'll just do the one scientific notation, I'll do both. That'd be 1.36, keep the one, keep the three, keep the six, and then afterward, the three and everything else are dropped, 1.36 times 10 to the fourth, otherwise known as 1,003 or 13,000. 600. So those would be the two answers that would be acceptable. And therefore, the answer we get is 1.36 times 10 to the fourth liters, or, or, or you could have written it that's not liters as tor, because I'm looking at pressure, and this would be tor also. And that's how you do it. Now, one of the fun things that we're going to start doing more and more is we're getting into more things that apply to your daily life. Yes, your daily life. So let's look at what we just did for this problem. How does that apply to your daily life? Well, what do we do? We had a piston and we pushed the plunger down and reduced the volume. And what happened to the pressure inside? It got real high. We started at 650, 651. We ended up with this sort of change 13,600. Boy, did that increase the pressure. Now, how many of you have ever filled up a bicycle tire or a beach ball or a football or volleyball? What do you use? A hand pump. And the hand pump has a special valve at the, ends, at the end that when you pull it this way, you suck in air when you push it this way, it compresses the air and comes out the valve into whatever you're trying to inflate. And think about it. How does that work? It increases the pressure and you're putting in gas at a much higher pressure, which inflates the beach ball, volleyball, football, soccer ball, not to let out, uh, forget about soccer fans. By the way, Dr. White's a Munchen Bayer fan. For those who don't know, that's Bundesliga, the German soccer league. I've been following that for many, many years. Also, I do watch the Premier League and English League. And also I watch, I can't think of their name right now, but the Mexican soccer league too. But anyways, I'm a soccer fan. I've gotten tired of American football. It's just too slow. But anyways, think about it. The next time you inflate a bicycle tire or a beach ball, volleyball, soccer ball, football, you're using Boyle's law to inflate it by a piston going from a large volume to smaller volume, and that increases the pressure. Now, how many of you have ever uh, put air into your car tires? Well, what do you find now is you got to pay for it, even though in my neighborhood, there's still two gas stations that is free. You don't have to pay for it. But what do you use to inflate your car tires? They call it a compressor. Why is it a compressor? Because if you push the button to turn it on, if it's a free one like Dr. White goes to, you hear this motor going. And what happens when you hear the motor going? you have a compressor, a cylinder that's pushing back and forth. And they also have a bigger container and that's building up pressure in a gas and that gas is air mostly, unless you go to uh, your dealership and in the last 10 years or more, 
they've been pushing, use this plain nitrogen, not air, which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. It's a waste of money, in my opinion, but that's my personal opinion, just use air. And that is compressing into what's called a ballast tank, and that has high pressure gas, much higher than the pressure of your tire. And that's how you fight it. So next time you fill your tire with air or anything else, think about it. You're using Boyle's Law. Ooh, I bet you didn't think chemistry is all around you. Remember, next time you feel the wind on your face, that's chemistry. The next time you see a compressor in a gas station, that's chemistry too, and other things too. But the principle how air compressor works is chemistry. All right, speaking about chemistry, I should share. But before I do this, oh no, I almost forgot. Shame on Dr. White. Everybody, public service announcement from me, the management, Dr. White. If you have lab tomorrow, I will be going through chapter eight practice problems. Make sure you try them first. If you have lab on Friday, guess what? I'll be going through chapter eight practice problems, same thing. Uh, and that reminds me, uh, for those who had lab last Friday, you know, I got kicked off the internet a lot, and therefore I never made a video. Look at the Thursday one, they're identical. Pretty much so, other than the faces on the screen are different. You know something, I was just looking at the clock. Let's do a real quick problem. Not with this. Why don't you try this one? Because there's not enough time for you to do a Boyle's Law problem without rushing. That's not good. But this one we can do real quick and end on a fun note. So how many tour is 7.111 atmosphere? Go. I like that. Go. Get going, start on it. Or I could have said in German, mach schnell. And for those of you who know Spanish, let me know how would you say, do it. Or if you know Italian, Greek, or Chinese, Japanese, how would you do it in that language? I'm always trying to learn. <laughs> I thought that Gabrielle means leave. If I remember some of the, okay, <laughs> which is similar to leave, but I don't want you to go yet. I guess you can get, let's get going. So I stand corrected. Thank you for teaching me. I forgot to pin myself. Ouch. Danny, what language is that? Spanish. <laughs> okay. How do you pronounce that properly? Aslo. And it means? Do it. 
All right. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. White, you're never too old to learn, and I'm always trying to learn. All right. As Danny said, do it in Spanish. Hazlo. Now I can get in trouble in a couple of different languages. Thanks. <laughs> All right. That's Dr. White's lazy. I'm going to do this. <clears throat> All right. Looks like everybody's done. Let's do it. What are we being asked to find? How many tour? What are we given? 7.11 one atmospheres. How do we do that? This is the only thing I have to start with. I want to get to Tor. I use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. I hopefully you're getting the hang of this. And hopefully you're finding this is your good friend especially you'll need it on test two and three and four in the final. And where do I get these numbers? From this definition that you will be given important information, test two and the final, 760 TOR. Is one atmosphere and these are both exact numbers which mean they don't play a role. Notice this is four significant figures. My answer will be four significant figures. I can now go to my calculator. I use this one. Let me go back. Yep. And my calculator gives me this one. And I'll let you round that off to four significant figures. Give you four seconds. Uh, time's up. Keep the five, keep the four, keep the zero, keep the four. Use the three to round off. That's four or less. Uh, so the correct answer is 5.404 times 10 to the third. And that's how you do it. And as I now look at the clock, it's time for Dr. White to say, happy St. Patrick's Day to all you people are celebrating. Gain, uh, Aaron Gobra, that means Ireland forever. And I'm going to say in Yiddish, gain gesund, be healthy. Bye. For those who have lab, I'll see you on Thursday. For those of you who have lab on Friday, I'll see you on Friday. And don't forget, if you need help, come to my office hours tonight. I'm always available there to help you. With that, I'll say again, gang is on. Goodbye.